Good morning. This is Humberto Martinez. I just want to take a few minutes to go over uh, my approach to uh, plain uh, chest radiographic reading. Before me, uh, PA radiograph, and you know that uh, because in most PA radiographs, the patient is upright, and you usually see gas in the fundus of the stomach close to the diaphragm. It also is accompanied with a lateral, so uh, most uh, PAs uh, go along with a lateral with rare exceptions. So the first thing I look at is to make sure that the technique is worthy uh, of us looking at the x-ray. Uh, if for some reason the radiograph uh, shows motion, uh, severe rotation, uh, extremely low volumes, or there's a part of the uh, uh, chest missing on the image, we may want to consider having the technologist repeating the image before we dictate it. Uh, most of the time, the x-rays are quite adequately uh, exposed and uh, framed, so we can go ahead. Uh, I tend to look usually at the things that we may forget to look at. I tend to look at the lungs last and especially try to avoid answering the question that they're asking uh, at first. For example, if they're asking to look for pneumonia or for a lung mass or for evaluation of heart size or mediastinum, I try to stay away from that and do that last so I don't forget the stuff that we should look at. For example, the high mass areas of the lung, which are the APCs, and we tend not to look at those very well. Make sure that the APCs are fairly symmetrical, that the bony structures are all there, that there are no ribs missing, comparing side to side. What are the other high mass areas, the hyla regions, in which there are so many vessels crossing? Um, they, we tend to overcall pulmonary nodules near the hyla, and our threshold has to drop. Therefore, look around and see if the hyla look fairly symmetrical, or if there's any hidden nodules, any asymmetric densities or sizes of the hyla that may indicate an underlying mass. Uh, the next area that we don't want to miss, particularly if you only are looking at a PA or a frontal study, is um, abnormalities that may hide, uh, like I say, over the hill, over the diaphragm. This is obviously not the base of the lung. There's a lot of lung continuing, and you can see here that there are vascular structures that continue to the posterior aspect of the lower lobes. Sometimes you can pick up nodules, masses, parenchymal consolidations, etc. So once I look at those areas that tend to hide things for me, I want to make sure that the patient's trachea is midline, uh, especially in a patient that is not rotated. Like in this particular case, the spinous processes seem to be fairly equidistant from each clavicular head. So that is a good, uh, a well-centered patient and well-positioned um, patient for the radiograph. The trachea should be midline above the thoracic inlet. It is commonly displaced to the right by the aortic arch. Of course, if you have a right-sided aortic arch, you'll have the opposite effect. You'll have a slight displacement to the left, but it should quickly return to midline um, above the thoracic inlet. Common things that displace the trachea, of course, are thyroid masses and adenopathy, etc. Uh, again, uh, it doesn't matter if you start from the outside looking in. Uh, make sure that all the bunny landmarks that you see are symmetrical, that nothing is missing. Chest x-rays are not the ideal exam for looking for rib fractures, but if you see uh, a rib fracture, you should mention it. I tend not to mention bone abnormalities, uh, I mean bone findings, unless I see a finding. Looking before we look at the lungs, uh, you know, looking at the contours, you know, we want to see everything sharp. We want to see a right costophrenic recess, which is sharp, a left costophrenic recess that is sharp. Obviously, small effusions can be missed on the PA. We want to look at the lateral as well. Right diaphragm, you know, it's usually higher than the left because of the liver, although there can be different uh, positionings of the diaphragms depending on congenital variants, congen uh, depending on the aeration of either lung and any other pathology, like phrenic nerve palsy. The right heart border is nice and sharp, like every other border of the cardiomediastinal silhouette when the lung around it is well inflated. Any missing parts of the cardiomediastinal silhouette may be due to adjacent 
uh, parenchymal disease. So let's go through the uh, borders that make up the cardiomediastinal silhouette. This is the right atrial border. This border that continues here is the superior vena cava. This we call the caval atrial junction, which is the waistline of the heart where the heart changes shape. If this border is convex rather than vertically oriented and straight, then it may not be the superior vena cava. You could have an ectatic aorta do that. The right hilum is sitting here. Uh, it's a quite, uh, quite a busy area. There's a lot of structures going in and out. Uh, here is the left hilum, uh, same structures, uh, slightly more superior in location. And that is because the left pulmonary artery goes over the left bronchus. Therefore, this left hilum should be naturally higher than this right hilum. Subtle finding, but it's there, and it's important when there are other abnormalities that change that. Most of the vessels that you see here are going to be the pulmonary arteries, the vast majority of them. There are some pulmonary venous uh, structures that are uh, coming from the upper lobes to drain into the left atrium, which sits behind just below the carina, and they are going to project over the hilum on the PA radiograph and add some density to it. The lower lobe pulmonary veins come in more horizontally directly into the left atrium and don't really add much density to the hilar structures. On an upright chest, like you see here, the vessels going to the lower lobes should be significantly larger than the vessels going to the upper lobes. That's gravity, and that's normal. If you see a change in that, that is pathological, and we can discuss that later. You can also see uh, very thin bronchial walls, which is what is normal, okay? The bronchial walls should be less than one millimeter, barely noticeable. Um, there's a structure that sometimes we see right across the carina at the tracheobronchial angle, which is the azygous vein. In this case, is very small, barely noticeable. As we go around the mediastinum, we're going to see the aortic arch uh, shaped like a doorknob. We call it the aortic knob. And we can see a very clear descending aorta all the way down to the diaphragm. And we should see that most of the time separate from the left paraspinal lines, although sometimes it may coincide. The heart should be fairly transparent on a well-exposed radiograph, so you can actually see the spine through it. You can actually see the landmark of the descending aorta, the right and left paraspinal lines, and the blood vessels branching behind the heart. When there's pathology in the lower lobes, you will begin to lose the contours of these normal structures that I've just mentioned. If we look at the lung parenchyma, most of the markings disappear or are practically invisible by the time we get to about two-thirds out in the periphery of the lungs. This is expected. If you see too many markings uh, in the subpleural regions, that probably indicates abnormal interstitial findings. The vessels should be nice and clear and distinct. In this particular case, we see a small calcified density that could be in the lung, and we may be able to see that better on the lateral view. Only on a well, um, on a good inspiratory chest radiograph, uh, which shows at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, at least nine uh, posterior ribs. Uh, this one shows 10, which is excellent. Should we begin to evaluate uh, the size of the cardiac silhouette and the mediastinum? In this particular case, if you just eyeball the size of the heart with the largest transverse diameter, it should fit inside half a thorax. It should not be more than 50% of the transverse diameter of the thorax as visualized at the level of the diaphragms. So let's look at the lateral now for more exciting anatomy. The lateral view is uh, definitely more challenging because you have all of the right-sided structures superimposed, superimposed upon the left-sided structures. It really completes the examination of the chest because it shows us areas that we will not be able to see clearly on the PA radiograph. For example, the retrosternal space, all of this airspace, this clear space, should be clear as you see it here. Any signs of uh, soft tissue density behind the sternum could raise the question of an anterior mediastinal mass or an enlarged right ventricle. Also, what we perceive as the top of the diaphragms on the PHS radiographs is what the, what the X-ray sees when it goes from posterior to anterior, casting the uh, shadow upon the um, receptor. So this is what we see as the top of the right diaphragm on the PA and this as the top of the uh, left. 
The right diaphragm is easy to recognize in this particular case because it's higher like it was on the PA, but the most reliable way is that the right diaphragm can be seen to continue over the heart all the way to the anterior chest wall most of the time. That is because there is no uh, significant amount of heart tissue sitting on the right diaphragm and therefore not obscuring its contour. That's the most reliable way of identifying which diaphragm is the right. If you follow it posteriorly, it'll take you by default to the right posterior costophrenic recess, which in this case is sharp and does not show any evidence of pleural fluid. It coincides with the larger, uh, more magnified rib cage because as you know, this is a left lateral radiograph with the patient's left side against the uh, receptor. Therefore, the left side should be least magnified. The left diaphragm we see here seems to disappear as it joins the heart, and that's obviously because the left heart sits on the left diaphragm and there is no interface between lung and diaphragm at that level. So the left diaphragm tends to disappear as it touches the heart. And here is the left posterior costrophenic recesses. These are more sensitive in detecting small amount of pleural fluid. A general rule is that you need a, as, much, a tw uh, as much as twice the amount of pleural fluid to obscure the lateral recesses on the PA radiograph than you need to blunt the posterior recesses on the lateral. Structures that we can visualize here if we go clockwise, the most anterior heart chamber is the right ventricle and it should fill about one third of the complete retrosternal airspace from the level of the right diaphragm all the way to the sternal angle. If the right ventricle is too large, it will obscure more of the retrosternal space. We can see the arch of the aorta, not like a drawing, but we can see the biggest arch in the thorax, which is the arch of the thoracic aorta. We can see this rounded structure coming uh, at us or actually going away from us. This is the right pulmonary artery. The left pulmonary artery, like I explained on the PA, goes over the left bronchus, which is coming at us here on end, this black structure, this dark structure filled with air. So this is like a mini arch of the big arch, and between them you see a very vague but definite separation. This is the aorticopulmonic window. This is important. This hyalur anatomy is vital when you have an abnormal hyalur contour on the PA and you want to determine whether it is due to enlarged pulmonary arteries or to lymphadenopathy, in which case this entire anatomy will be totally obliterated. Do not fantasize that you're going to see this anatomy uh, in 100% of lateral uh, radiographs in normal patients. Only about 75% of the time you will see some of the anatomy. And in some patients, the anatomy will be even more clearly seen than in others, depending on the degree of inflation of the lungs. The posterior structures here, we see two lines. Uh, this is the posterior aspect of the heart, which has the posterior chambers. More superiorly, typically the left atrial border, and you may see significant isolated bulging of the left posterior atrial border superiorly as the left ventricular border remains normal. This other vertical line that you see here is the posterior wall of the inferior vena cava because it has lung behind it. It doesn't have lung in front of it. It has right atrium. Therefore, you will not see the anterior border of the IBC. We can use that line uh, to measure or to estimate the size of the left ventricle. And the rule is from the right diaphragm uh, moving up about two centimeters and at that point making sure that the left ventricle does not extend more than two centimeters behind it. So we've been able to evaluate left atrial border for left atrial enlargement, left ventricular border, and right ventricular border. As you see, the right atrial measurements on plain film are not as reliable. There's something I want you to notice about the lateral and the spine. Notice that the thoracic spine is more radiopaque superiorly and gradually becomes more lucent. This is called the more black sign of the spine, and this is normal as there are less overlying muscular structures and bony structures lower down. If this should change and this spine should become as dense, you have to be concerned that there may be paraspinal pathology or pathology in 
either lower lobe. I want you to realize that between the aortic knob and the left hilum, there's a very important area that should be preserved, and this is the aorticopulmonic window. This area should be nicely concave. It should never fill in and be convex, as you can have mediastinal nodes uh, that can fill it, as well as lung pathology, and as well as aortic or pulmonary artery pathology that can fill it. You should confirm once the pulmonary, once the aortic or pulmonic window is obscured on the PA, that it is clear or also obscured on the lateral. If such is the case, the patient may need for uh, may have a need for further imaging with CT of the chest.